Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ravi Mamtani. I am a professor and vice dean at Weill Cornell Medical College in Qatar. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you um, to our population health and, and well being series. And uh, as you will see in a few minutes, we have an exciting topic and an ex equally exciting speaker. So before I introduce our esteemed speaker, let me take you through the objectives and other housekeeping notes uh, before we begin the seminar. So for those of you who attended these seminars before will know that the objectives of the series are, one, to discuss contemporary and critical topics relevant to healthcare, medicine, and population health. Two, examine evidence-based practices germane to public health and patient care. And three, describe opportunities and challenges in the evolving phase of healthcare and, and population health. Um, so some housekeeping notes. As I said, your cameras and microphones are turned off. Please use the Q&A feature of type questions and comments that you might have. Any questions, please include them in that. Questions will be addressed at the end of the session. Uh, this activity, as, as you know from before, has been approved by the ACCME um, for continuing medical education. It is also approved by, by uh, Ministry of Public Health um, uh, for one hour, category one, one hour of, of activity. Uh, insofar as evaluation and certificates are concerned, the the post-activity evaluation will be available in your Cloud CME uh, account by October the 21st. You will receive an email notification once the evaluation is available in your Cloud CME account. And your certificates will be available for download once you complete the post-activity evaluation on the Cloud CME uh, portal. So here is we where we stand today, uh, the topic is the role of lifestyle medicine in population health. And to present that topic, we have, as I said, an esteemed, a well-known, world-renowned expert in lifestyle medicine. So if I can just take a couple of minutes to introduce Dr. James Rippey. Uh, Dr. Rippey is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Medical School with postgraduate training at Massachusetts General Hospital in USA. He's currently the foundation, the founder and director of the Rippey Life, Lifestyle Institute and professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Over the past 25 years, Dr. Rippey has established and run the largest research organization in the world, exploring how daily habits and actions impact short and long-term health and quality of life. This organization, namely Rippey Lifestyle Institute, has published hundreds of papers that form the scientific basis for the fields of lifestyle medicine and high-performance health. I like that description, high-performance health. Further information on Rippey Lifestyle Institute may be obtained by visiting rippeyhealth.com. Dr. Rippey edits the only academic textbook in lifestyle medicine entitled Lifestyle Medicine and published by CRC Press. He just informed me that there is a fourth edition on its way and the information will be made available to us, which we will share with you should you care to buy that book. I would recommend that you buy it. He's also the editor in chief of the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. Dr. Rippey has written or edited 59 books, including 36 academic textbooks and 23 books for the general public. Dr. Rippey's books may be accessed on his Amazon book pages. Clearly and absolutely no doubt, Dr. Rippey is a champion and an accomplished leader in the field of lifestyle medicine. So with this brief remarks before I invite uh, Dr. Rippey to the podium, may I request Raji to post the disclosure statements on the screen, please. Uh, please now join me in welcoming Dr. Rippey. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Rapi, for joining us this evening. And we really appreciate, we know how busy you are. And, and finding the time to be with us this evening, we, we're just very grateful to you. So please, our gratitude to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Montami, and uh, for your very kind introduction and the invitation to uh, address your uh, esteemed audience. Um, I should mention that uh, I come from, from you today uh, at a different time zone. I'm, my family lives right outside of Boston. Um, I understand that uh, Dr. Montami also maintains an apartment uh, in New York. And um, I know that in Qatar, Qatar I'm, I'm going to work on my pronunciation, Qatar, um, the, the, there are avid sports fans. And in Boston, we also have avid sports fans. And um, I'm sorry to say, Dr. Montami, that our team is continuing to do well, the Boston Red Sox. And, and unfortunately, but happy for us to get into the, to the championship series uh, in baseball, they had to beat the New York Yankees. Now, um, that's really a big deal in Boston because the New York Yankees always beat us. So we're, we're very pleased to get to the championship series and particularly pleased to do it by beating the New York Yankees. So. Uh, uh, I know Dr. Montami uh, for a variety of reasons from the lifestyle medicine uh, field, and also because he and his colleagues wrote a, a, a wonderful uh, article uh, in, for the journal that I at the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine on on the FIFA World Cup, with the hope that the FIFA will this this coming year in Qatar will uh, stimulate people to think about even more. Uh, their health and, and lifestyle. So um, uh, I know you have a, na a national sports day. We, we share your enthusiasm for sports, but, but I share with Dr. Montami the commitment to try to make everybody pay more conscious effort uh, to their own um, health and well being. That's the essence of lifestyle medicine. Now, Dr. Montami mentioned a number of things that, of, about me, but I, I just uh, want to spend a few minutes talking about who I am and how I happen to get into the field of lifestyle medicine. I'm a cardiologist and um, I, as Dr. Montami uh, indicated, I trained in what people have lovingly called the Harvard Life Program. I, Harvard College, Harvard Medical School, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, which is one of the main teaching hospitals uh, at Harvard. And uh, so I, I learned a long time ago that if you want to be credible, and if you want to make a long-term impact, it's key that you focus on evidence. Evidence-based medicine is how we all want to practice. And it's an area that we have tried very hard to bring into the area of lifestyle medicine. The, the, medis the, the field, the background of why what we do on a daily basis impacts on our health and well-being, both short and long-term and our quality of life. There's an enormous literature that supports that. And yet, unfortunately, we in modern medicine have not paid enough attention to it. So I've devoted the last 25 years of my career uh, to, to trying to help the medical profession and ultimately the public at large understand how profoundly important it is to pay attention to your daily lifestyle habits and practices. And we'll get into that in more detail over the course of the webinar. Um, the power of doing this um, came home to me in my own career, because when I started out as a cardiologist, I spent the first 10 years of my career doing heart catheterizations. I've done thousands of heart catheterizations. And oftentimes, we ended up doing three or four heart catheterizations on the same person. And, I, I, and they came back with the same bad habits. And so I, I thought there must be a better way. There must be a better way uh, to help people so we don't have to end up doing all these heart catheterizations. And so I thought, well, maybe the things that I do in my daily life, um, which I know are powerful uh, health promoting habits, such as walking and running, strength training, uh, I'm an avid swimmer, um, all of those things, and I pay attention to what I eat, I've never smoked cigarettes, all of those things, 
were things that I thought we ought to be focusing more attention on. And that's why I got uh, uh, into the field of lifestyle medicine. And as I, as I mentioned to Dr. Montami, um, my organization actually named the field lifestyle medicine. And we did this with the first big academic textbook that I edited back in 1999 uh, called Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, that then spawned a number of, of other organizations to get involved. It was, it was the impetus for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to get involved and it's, it's grown wonderfully over the last 20 years. So uh, that's a little bit about who I am. I, I should mention, I am editing the fourth edition of this book now. It, it's, it will be available. It's, the third edition is currently available. The fourth edition will be available in 2023. So um, that's how uh, I, as a cardiologist, got involved in the field of lifestyle medicine. So I, I want to focus a little bit of attention now on why this field is so important. Uh, we know from uh, the World Health Organization that 71% of all death, all mortality in the world now is a result of bad habits, uh, cigarette smoking, lack of physical activity, uh, obesity, uh, poor nutrition, 71%. There, there are more, these are what are called non-communicable non -communicable diseases and they dominate now. This is, uh, the, that's the sad reality of the world that we live in. Well, what about Qatar? It's, it's almost identical. 69%, according to the Qatar National Health Strategy document, 69% of all deaths in Qatar come from uh, non-communicable diseases. So it's very similar to the, the national uh, uh, impact uh, that we are seeing all around the world. And uh, as I mentioned to Dr. Montami, one uh, example that I often uh, uh, quote uh, comes from what, what, what is called the Nurses' Health Trial. This is a trial that was done uh, at the Harvard Medical School and, uh, and uh, Harvard School of Public Health. And um, the, um, it followed 100,000 nurses for over 20 years. And what they showed was that if nurses followed five simple habits on a daily basis, they would substantially reduce their risk of both heart disease and diabetes. So mm -hmm. the five things were 30 minutes of physical activity on most days, sound nutrition, more fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains, occasional fish meals, uh, maintain a proper body weight, body mass index between 18 and 25 in the healthy range, um, don't smoke cigarettes, and then the most controversial of all, drink one alcoholic beverage a day. So those are the five things that, that, that if nurses did all five of those things, they would reduce their risk of heart disease by 80%, the number one killer around the world, reduced by 80% by following these simple lifestyle habits and practices. And they would reduce their risk of diabetes by over 90%. And we'll talk, talk a little bit further in, in this webinar about why those are important in the, around the world, important in the United States and also important in Qatar. Um, I'm personally uh, uh, no, noticed how, how well this whole, whole emphasis has spread around the world. I'm, I, I, as I mentioned to Dr. Montami before we started the webinar, later this month, uh, I'm giving the, the special invited lecture um, for China's first Center for Healthy Lifestyle Medicine at the Fuwei Hospital. And uh, last year for this conference that I'm speaking at, they had over 600,000 participants. So this is clearly something that has caught people's attention uh, all around the world. And I'm delighted that uh, in Qatar, uh, the Population Health uh, Institute uh, has decided to have lifestyle medicine as a key component of what, of, of what you're uh, doing. So um, let me uh, now move on to what I would call the components of lifestyle medicine. The first uh, component is regular physical activity. Uh, that's uh, very, very important. And um, it's something that I, uh, I can count on one hand, the number of days every year that I don't get at least 30 minutes of physical activity. I'm so committed to this. And I actually have written um, a, a little book. If you go to um, our Rippy Health uh, page, I have a, just published a book last year on how to 
how to how physicians can help people get more physical activity in their lives. Um, are we doing enough around the world? Well, in the United States, unfortunately, only 25% of people are, are following the guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control to get 30 minutes of, of moderate intensity physical activity on most, if not all days, only 25%. And uh, in Qatar, the, the, there is a, a, a very significant problem in this area. 43% of people are totally sedentary. And unfortunately, over 80% of women are sedentary. So this is a big problem. And to put this in perspective, uh, a paper came out uh, from the Centers for Disease Control a number of years ago, which said, okay, look, we've got about, according to the criteria in this paper, we have about 60% of people are truly sedentary. It's, it's, you could, somewhere between 50 and 60% are truly sedentary. And those people double their risk of heart disease. If you're sedentary, if you choose, to be sedentary, as, a, as the majority of people both in the United States and Qatar uh, do, you are doubling your risk of heart disease. And to put that in perspective, if you choose to be sedentary, you have increased your risk of heart disease as much as if you smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. So in the United States, about 15% of people smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, it's a terrible habit, but over 60% are sedentary. So we have a risk factor that's as bad as smoking, in terms of heart disease, as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day and four times as prevalent. So we've got to do a better job both in the United States and Qatar and around the world actually uh, in getting people more physically active. It's one of the key components of the World Health Organization uh, initiative to combat lifestyle medicine, to com excuse me, to combat uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. They certainly don't wanna combat lifestyle medicine, they wanna emphasize lifestyle medicine. Okay, the second thing I wanna talk about is a little bit is nutrition. Now we, we all know that what we eat impacts on our health, but it impacts a lot. Um, it's one of the major considerations that we think about in the area of lifestyle medicine. We, we know that if we ate more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, paid attention to the number of calories in our diet, we could lower uh, the risk of virtually every metabolic disease. So how are, how are we doing? Um, in the United States, it's, I'm sad to tell you that only 12% of people are eating the recommended servings of fruit and only 9% are eating the recommended servings of vegetables. Well, is Qatar doing better? No, in Qatar, according to your national health survey, over 90% of people are not eating enough fruits and vegetables. So it's a worldwide problem and it's something that we in the area of lifestyle medicine need to do more about. Well, what about weight management? Weight management is another very important topic. Um, the world is too fat, that's the sad truth. And this used to be a problem that only happened in high income countries, but now it has spread around the world. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, has said that within the next 20 years, over 3.1 billion people will be obese. Um, we're, as more affluence has come to low and middle income countries, so has obesity. Unfortunately, uh, good economic conditions in countries often result in obesity. Now in the United States, we have a very significant problem in this area, over 70% of adults in the United States are either overweight or obese. 70%, seven out of 10 people are either overweight uh, or obese. And about half of those are overweight, the body mass index uh, between 25 and 30, about the other half, about high 30% are uh, clearly obese body mass index of greater than 30. And unfortunately, uh, the, this has not really changed very much uh, in the last 20 years. In fact, it's gotten a lot worse and it's particularly worse in the people who are obese. That's, that's one uh, area where uh, the, the percentage of people have actually grown. Well, what about Qatar? 43% of people in Qatar are obese. So uh, it's, a, it's a problem that we share and it's a problem where we need to do more about it 
uh, by emphasizing to people how dangerous it is to be overweight. A person who is obese by the time that they are in their 50s cuts a decade off of their life. So it's, it's not, uh, this is not a vanity issue. This is clearly a health issue. Obesity is one of the significant risk factors for both heart disease uh, and uh, diabetes. And, uh, and, and believe it or not, it's actually one of the major risk factors for cancer. A lot of people don't realize that, can that obesity is the second leading cause of cancer in the world. So, and if current trends continue in the next 20 years, it will become the first by surpassing cigarette smoking. Well, let's talk about cigarette smoking for a, for a few minutes. Um, we all know that cigarette smoking is bad. It's a habit, it's, a, it's, it's an addiction, it's hard to break, but it's, um, it's, it, it's very, very dangerous. We know that a significant risk factor for heart disease, significant risk factor for lung cancer, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, this has been known for a long, long time. The darn problem is, that cigarette smoking is very addictive. It's hard to stop. And we've had many public health campaigns in the United States, and we've made some progress uh, in this area. Uh, but unfortunately, that progress has kind of slowed down now, and uh, about 15% of the population in the United States uh, still smoke cigarettes. Well, uh, what about Qatar? Uh, unfortunately, you, you have a significant problem in this area too. 22% uh, of men smoke. Uh, and good news here is that only about 8% uh, of women smoke. But if, if the, the trends in the United States are similar to Qatar, um, women are increasingly smoking. It, it happened in the United States and uh, 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 you, you need to be vigilant about this and make sure that in every clinical encounter, physicians are talking about many of these dangers, but cigarette smoking for sure. Um, the next area I wanna talk about a little bit, which may surprise you, is the area of sleep. Now, we tend to think of sleep as being a non-issue. Uh, sleep is just something that we do, but actually sleep is a very important component of health. Uh, we know that if people have disordered sleep, which is com very common, about 30% of people have disordered sleep. They wake up in the middle of the night, have trouble getting back to sleep, um, or at the worst, they have sleep apnea, which is commonly associated with obesity. You, if you have disordered sleep or sleep apnea, you increase your risk of cardiovascular disease by about 30 or 40%. So we need to, and one of the great ways of, in, of uh, improving sleep is to get regular physical activity. So it's, it's an important issue and often o overlooked in medicine. The next topic I wanna to spend a little, a little time talking about is stress reduction. Um, I was very pleased, uh, I wanna compliment Qatar for having a strategy that involves population health. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, the document is the National Health Strategy, which, uh, which uh, Dr. Montami uh, shared with me, the National Health Strategy for 2018 to 2022. And one of the priority areas is mental health. And this does not seem to be a big problem right now in Qatar, um, but there's a four to 5% likelihood of people being either anxious or depressed. And that's, a, that's an issue because those people are less likely to take their medicines. And there's actually some association uh, between uh, anxiety or depression and increased risk of various metabolic diseases. Um, and the final thing that um, I wanna talk about um, is inter interactions with other people. Um, this is an area that uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has been a leader in about positive relationships and the, their health promoting benefits. Now, I'm not an expert on the, the interpersonal relationships in Qatar, um, but um, it is an area that we tend to underestimate when it comes to um, our, our, our health. It certainly is an important issue when it comes to the quality of life, but it can actually carry significant uh, uh, benefits uh, for lowering your risk of chronic disease. In fact, there's one study that showed that people who volunteer live longer than people who don't. So there, there are lots of reasons to think about, are we doing well with other people? Well, let me now uh, turn to um, the area of how lifestyle medicine um, interacts with various uh, chronic diseases. As a cardiologist, of course, I'm gonna focus first on cardiovascular disease. 
Cardiovascular disease is a worldwide epidemic. Um, in the United States, 37% um, of all mortality comes from cardiovascular disease. It's by far the leading cause of mortality in the United States. In Qatar, it's about 40, 44% of all mortality comes from cardiovascular disease. And, and the, the, the sad truth here is that, that we, we know what works to lower the risk of heart disease. It's what I already told you about from the nurses' health trial. Uh, don't smoke, uh, be physically active, uh, maintain a proper weight, uh, uh, eat more fruits and vegetables. All of those things are research proven factors to lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. But what about around the world? We know around the world, this is another uh, epidemic that is spreading. Uh, 20 years ago, 26% of deaths around the world uh, came from cardiovascular disease, but now it's 32%. So again, um, as affluence or at least a better economy has spread around the world, so has some of the problems of, of, of this and, and cardiovascular disease is one of the major ones. Uh, in uh, Qatar, uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death. And um, it has grown a shocking 57% in the last decade. So it's, a, it's an area that is very dangerous and it's an area that's growing rapidly around the world and certainly in Qatar. Um, how about diabetes? When you think about lifestyle medicine and lifestyle modalities and diabetes, of course, they're the foundation for both the treatment and prevention of diabetes. Uh, certainly weight management, um, not smoking cigarettes, regular physical activity. I've often said that it's possible to be obese and not diabetic, but it's very unusual for somebody who is diabetic to not be obese. So that's particularly type two diabetes, so-called adult onset diabetes. It's the third leading cause of death in Qatar. Uh, and in the United States, we have a significant problem. 11% of the population uh, has diabetes. In Qatar, 17% of the population has diabetes. So this is an epidemic that accompanies sedentary lifestyle and obesity and it's something that we all need, particularly in, in affluent countries such as Qatar and the United States, we need to pay much more attention to this. Um, okay, uh, obesity, we've talked about obesity. Uh, it's a big problem in the United States and, and in, in Qatar. Uh, about 40 some percent of people in Qatar are obese. In the United States, it's about the same. Um, we have the danger of in, of eliminating all of the other good work we've done in areas like high blood pressure and getting people to stop smoking and getting people to be a little more physically active. We did, we've got, um, a, if we don't combat obese, the twin epidemics of obesity and diabetes, all that good work um, may be for naught. Uh, there are um, two more issues that I think are, um, important to emphasize. Um, the first is infectious disease. Now it may seem strange for a cardiologist to be talking about infectious disease, um, but we are in the midst of a worldwide um, pandemic of COVID-19. And in the United States, we know that people who have chronic medical conditions, such as heart disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, are three times as likely to be hospitalized and three to four times as likely to die uh, of heart disease as uh, compared to people who do not have any of those chronic diseases. So there is a very strong linkage between what we do in our daily lives and our ability to, to uh, suppress or stop or not suffer serious, serious consequences from an infectious disease like COVID-19. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, something that people don't think about but it's, it's a very significant issue. Now I understand uh, that in Qatar, uh, there's, there have, there's been a very good uh, campaign for in, uh, vaccinations and there's still a low risk of uh, COVID-19, but people who are susceptible uh, to it um, are those people who are obese or have hypertension or um, cardiovascular disease or diabetes. The final uh, uh, condition that I wanna talk about um, is um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Now, once again, most physicians don't think about 
Alzheimer's disease or dementia as being lifestyle related. And that's a mistake. Uh, we know that many of the same risk factors for heart disease are the same risk factors, not all of them, but, but many of them, uh, the same risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, for example. And this is the cornerstone for a document that was generated by the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association entitled uh, Optimal Brain Health. Uh, and the recommendation was for people to follow the same recommendations uh, that, that we have in place for lowering the risk of heart disease to lower your risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease. We don't know exactly why that works. It certainly lowers the risk of stroke. Um, it also probably following lifestyle medicine uh, practices lowers the risk of inflammation, which we think is a key component of Alzheimer's disease. And the, the data now seems to support that you need to do that as early as possible in your life uh, if you want to lower your risk of Alzheimer's disease. The United States has a significant problem in this. Uh, we have 4.9 million people currently living uh, with Alzheimer's disease. I suspect it's less of a problem in Qatar, but um, uh, I, don't, I don't know that for a fact. Okay, I now wanna uh, move on to uh, the application of uh, lifestyle medicine principles for various populations. And the first one um, is uh, the elderly, people over the age of 65. Um, when I was a, a young cardiologist, I didn't used to think about this, but I'm now over the age of 65. And so uh, it's it, important for me personally, and it's important I think for, for all of us to understand that if you reach the age of 65, you are, if you're an male in Qatar, you're likely to live 18 more years. If you are a woman and you reach the age of 65, you're likely to live 20 more years. I don't know why women live a little bit longer after the age of 65 than men, but, but nonetheless, both, live, both men and women over the age of 65 have a, a lot of time left in their lives. And, um, and so the recommendation, which came from a wonderful document, which I would highly recommend for you, called the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans 2018, uh, a compendium of a wonderful evidence-based enormous compendium of all the relationships that we know uh, about physical activity uh, specifically and lowering the risk of various chronic diseases. Um, that the recommendation there for people to obtain 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most if not all days, a total of 150 minutes per week um, applies equally well to people who are elder. So uh, that's it's something that we, we need to emphasize not only to uh, younger people, but also for people over the age of 65. We're not doing enough uh, and we, we need to do better. Right now, uh, Qatar is a fairly young population. Uh, according to the, the National Health uh, uh, Strategy document, only 2% of, of people in Qatar are over the age of 65, but that's likely to grow significantly in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. In the United States, in the next 20 years, we think our population over the age of 65 will double. It's currently about 13%. It will be 25% of people um, by, will be over the age of 65 uh, in the, within the next 20 years. So it's that's a quarter of the population. So we need to pay a lot of attention. And that's when we see people having many chronic diseases and we can for, forestall a lot of those by what people do in their daily lifestyle and habits. But what about the other end of the spectrum, uh, children and adolescents? Uh, are we really raising healthy, healthy children? And the sad truth is we are not. Um, adults need to be a better model for, for children. We need to pay more attention to uh, the health uh, of children. Uh, in the United States, uh, the prevalence of childhood obesity has doubled in the last uh, 20 years. And physical activity is very low in the United States. Uh, less than 20% of adolescents in the United States get the recommended amount of physical activity on a daily basis. It's actually 60 minutes. It's a little bit more than, than adults, but they're young, they can do it. Um, the same thing is true in Qatar. Uh, the, the physical activity uh, uh, document uh, for Qatar says that only, let's see, it's only 18% uh, of boys and 15% of girls um, are physically active at the recommended level. And obesity tends to follow that 
uh, there's about the same level of obesity in uh, both boys and girls. So uh, it's, a, it's a problem that we share. And uh, since we know that the roots of many chronic diseases are in the manifestations are in adulthood, but the roots are in childhood, it's something that we need to pay attention to. These are lifelong lifestyle issues and we need to do a better job of, of, of helping our children with recommendations and facilities, et cetera, uh, to get them to be more physically active and pay attention pay attention to their weight. Um, uh, the area of women's health is one that's very important. Uh, it's important in the United States. It's important uh, in Qatar. Um, the, uh, there are fewer, as I already mentioned, over 80% of women are not physically active in Qatar. Uh, in the United States, it's a, a little less than that. It's uh, uh, in the United States, about 30% uh, of women are physically active. So we've done a job, a good job, of increasing that level of physical activity, but it's something that we need to continue to work on. And I was very pleased also to see that in the priorities uh, for the, the national um, uh, health strategy document, uh, there was also an emphasis on special needs uh, because we need to, we tend to not pay enough attention to the lifestyle issues uh, that may need to be modified to some degree to help people who have special needs. Well, I wanna close by uh, talking about the future of lifestyle medicine. And um, I'm very optimistic. I mean, I, there, we, we simply have to do better. Um, many of the chronic diseases that we see around the world are not economically sustainable, uh, and particularly in, and even in affluent countries like the United States and Qatar. Um, we're, we're spending an increasing amount of time with problems that could be handled in a very cost-effective way if we encourage people to do those simple cost-effective me measures, such as increasing their physical activity, not smoking, uh, paying proper attention to their weight, uh, and et cetera. So I'm optimistic, but it's going to be a big challenge. And I'm delighted that, uh, that uh, at the uh, Weill Cornell Medical College in, in uh, Qatar, uh, the, there's an emphasis on population health. That's something that we need to do uh, more, more with. We also need to, uh, engage and alert the medical community to the importance of all of these issues. Um, in the United States, it's, uh, it's sad to tell you that over 40, only about 40% of physicians ever counsel their patients on physical activity and weight and even cigarette smoking, 40% 40, 40 or less. And that's a, that's a very, very unfortunate because over 70% of the population sees their primary care physician on at least a yearly basis. So it's a missed opportunity that only 40% of doctors are talking about this. Um, what about Qatar? The national survey suggests that only 13% of physicians in Qatar are talking about lifestyle issues, uh, particularly physical activity and weight management. So uh, it's one of the big challenges for the Institute for Population Health to get out there and convince the, the um, medical community that this is important to do. And um, I once gave a lecture, uh, Grand Rounds, at a, a medical facility in, in uh, the United States where the gentleman, the physician who invited me to give uh, the lecture said, now I need to warn you, that you say you wanna talk about lifestyle medicine, but I need to warn you that the people here are evidence-based. And I said, well, that's very interesting because so am I. Maybe we just have different evidence to talk about. And when I, when I spoke to uh, the audience, I, I started off by saying, now I understand you're evidence-based. Um, that's something that we share. Now I'd like to see a show of hands for how many people recommend increased physical activity and proper nutrition for people who have hypertension. There are about 500 people in the audience. One person raised his hand. And I said, well, that's interesting because the national guidelines, the Joint National Commission on the Treatment and Evaluation of Hypertension recommends that. So you say you're evidence-based, but you're not following the evidence-based guidelines. So we need to help physicians understand that the evidence is clear. 
that it's compelling that these these lifestyle habits and actions are very very important and often not things that we think about in the regular course of our medical careers. Um, this is something that that is, has been a, a focus and effort of mine for many, many years. And I think it's very important to, that we continue to emphasize that not only to the public at large, but also to the medical community. I was very pleased as a cardiologist that um, the council that I sit on, American Heart Association, used to be called the Council on Nutrition and Metabolism, but it changed its name a few years ago to the Council on Lifestyle and Cardiometabolic Health. And in the last few years, three important documents have come out from the American Heart Association, one on management of cholesterol, one on management of blood pressure, and one on practice guidelines. And all of them start by saying the most important thing is a positive lifestyle. So I think we are making some headway, but the challenges are great. And, and we've got to enlist, enlist everybody uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this emphasis. And, and I'm very pleased. Um, of course, I was pleased that that uh, Dr. Montami invited me to give uh, this lecture. I'm, I'm pleased that um, as I look at the documents that, uh, that for, from Qatar, uh, it, it is clear that, that there's a big vision for improving the health of all the citizens of Qatar. And, and population health is gonna be a very important component of that. So that's why I entitled my talk, Lifestyle Medicine and Population Health. And I hope that I have left you with a couple of key ideas. The first one is what we do on a daily basis. Physical activity, weight management, not smoking, all of those things are profoundly important for our short and long-term health and quality of life. And that's the first lesson, the first concept that I hope that I've left you. And the second concept is never be embarrassed about talking about evidence because the evidence is there. It's just that a lot of physicians and a lot of people in, in the public at large don't realize how powerful these things are. So we have a really important campaign in front of us to help educate people that cancer is not an, uh, an act of God. Um, heart disease doesn't just happen out of nowhere. Um, obesity doesn't happen overnight. Um, there are things that we do in our daily lives that, that make a huge difference in that. And that is the essence of lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine, it's been a focus of my career for the last 25 years to say, read the evidence, look at the evidence. If you look at the evidence, you, you can no longer be, can, you can no longer fool yourself by thinking, that what you do on a daily basis doesn't impact on your health. It impacts enormously. And I know that, that there is some uh, emphasis now in population health uh, with Dr. Montami and others uh, to now start thinking about what's the future. And I think the future is, is um, evidence-based research. Uh, and my organization stands ready to work with uh, Dr. Montami and the rest of the people of the Institute of Population Health to really begin to, to underscore how important this evidence is and how incredibly important it is to the health of all people around the world and particularly in this instance, the population of Qatar. Well, thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you very much for your um, opportunity to speak to you about something that I obviously care a lot about. And um, I hope that this is something that may have uh, stimulated some thinking uh, on your part and I'll be happy to answer any Question, questions or comments that uh, come up. So I will now turn the podium back over to Dr. Montami. Well, Dr. Rippey, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, very comprehensive, balanced. And I'm also grateful to you for having complimented Qatar uh, on some of the indicators uh, that you shared with us. So thank you so much. We're also grateful to you for your positive comments about the Institute for Population Health where we all work and we do the best we can to further the goals of lifestyle medicine in Qatar, the region and beyond. So thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A and the chat. There are participants who are appreciating your, your comments and your talk. 
uh, so, so thank you so much once again. Uh, questions have started to come in. So if I may begin with some of the questions that have come and, and please request for you to either comment on them or answer them. Uh, you mentioned about the non-communicable disease, chronic disease paradigm in the world, and you made remarks about Qatar. Clearly, it is of concern to everyone worldwide. You mentioned projections that 3.1 billion number is scary, Dr. Rippey, it's very scary. Yes. Uh, now, there is a, you, you had talked about the aging population. You had mentioned 2%, 3%. Here's a question on, on aging. So the participant is asking if you could comment on impact of healthy or successful aging initiatives, maybe some of the ones that you've been involved with, some, of, some maybe that have, you may have either observed or, or participated in the US or anywhere else in the world. Uh, can you share with us some of your thoughts on that? so as to improve the quality of people who are aging, but also on their functional abilities. So if you can please comment on that and elaborate, Dr. Rippey. Yes, it's a very good, very good question and a very important um, concept. I was a little shocked actually to read in the, in the National Health Strategy for Qatar that um, only 2% of the population is over the age of 65. That seems very low to me, but maybe that's uh, your, your young country. Um, in the United States, it's a lot, it's a lot more than that. Yeah. And in China, it's 166 million people over the age of 65. The, the most um, definitive document uh, on this uh, is I uh, mentioned, uh, and this should be at least the executive summary for this should be in the toolbox of every physician. And that's this Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans 2018. And uh, you can just get that uh, off the uh, NIH website. Um, and there's a whole chapter um, uh, on the benefits of, of physical activity for people over the age of 65. And, um, and it just, it's an enormous compendium of evidence on why it's so important for people over the age of 65. Now, um, to be physically active, um, I've actually uh, written a book on physical activity, uh, as I mentioned, and uh, there's a whole, I've, I have a chapter on uh, people over the age of 65 and why it's so important. And um, it's very important for functional uh, capacity. And uh, one modification uh, that I recommend, and so, so does the physical activity guidelines for Americans, uh, that it not, not only be aerobic activity such as walking, uh, but, but there's also a second part of this that's part of the recommendation, and that is two strength training sessions per week. Um, and then uh, for people over the age of 65, also balance exercises. Um, so that those are the three key components of that. And, um, and that's important because uh, over the age of 65, there's an increased incidence of falling. And um, a fall is often the end of independent living for somebody who is in in uh, their 60s, 70s, or 80s. So, uh, and there's one final thing, and this may surprise uh, people, uh, that uh, two, two final things. Uh, regular physical activity also is very important for cognition. It's very important for your thinking. And, and that doesn't end at the age of 65. Uh, to regular physical activity is very important for what we call executive function. Uh, and so uh, there, there, there's that. Um, there's one other part here that's important to emphasize, and that is if you have normal blood pressure at the age of 65, according to Framingham data, which was a big uh, study done in the United States, you have a 90% likelihood of having hypertension by the time you reach the age of 90. So it's, it's not just a few people, it's almost everybody. And so one of the great ways of combating that is to maintain a proper body weight and to keep keep the amount of salt in your diet low uh, and um, uh, engage in regular physical activity. So there's a wealth of data. Uh, uh, I've written about this in my physical activity book. There, there's also, if people don't wanna get the big lifestyle medicine textbook, um, I have a manual of lifestyle medicine. If people go to uh, Amazon just and just Google uh, James Rippey, you'll see a lot of the books that I've done and 
or go to our Rippy Health website. I'm not trying to sell books. I'm just, uh, it's just, I really care passionately about people understanding that the evidence is out there. We just need to, to know where it is and uh, then apply it. Thank you, Dr. Rippy, is what I said. Uh, there were the two participants who were asking, I think you may have addressed the question partially, uh, looking at ways and means and being creative uh, to look for opportunities to engage in physical activity. And I think you nicely mentioned, uh, for example, mall, open clubs, and so on and so forth. Um, but is there anything else people can do? Because physical activity is so important, as you pointed out. Is there anything more we can do to become creative? I used to tell, I mean, I, I, I've spoken on the same topic where I say, if you cannot go out because of COVID-19, if you have stairs at home, go up and down a few times <laughs> and you're done. So I guess there are two or three participants asking because oftentimes it's so difficult for us to meet the recommendations of 115 minutes as a case in point. What, what else is there that we can do so that we can meet these requirements and have a have a great, healthy life. Anything else you want to add to that, please? Well, well you made a very important point, uh, Dr. Montami. I, I've often said that stairways are one of the least used exercise areas around. So even, even buildings that have, tall buildings that have elevators, walk up and down the stairs for 10 minutes. And it, oh, the other important part is, used to be, and I was one of the architects of uh, the, these guidelines uh, 20 years ago, that said, you need to get this in, in bouts of at least 10 minutes. Three 10 minute bouts a day will, is the same. And now, but the most recent guidelines say any uh, <laughs> uh, level of physical activity, um, uh, you, you, two minutes, three minutes here, uh, here and there. So it, it doesn't have to be particular sessions and, and it doesn't have to be so intense that you perspire. So you can, so those are, uh, so stairways are underutilized and that's a good way. Another thing is, uh, you should engage the, the schools and colleges in Qatar. Um, oftentimes, those, those facilities are closed when they're not in session. But we, we, we uh, should be saying to them, let's, let's make use of this facility. Let's, yeah. People need to get more physical activity. We've, that, that's one of the best things that the school can do is to open up their facilities uh, for for a couple of hours of exercise in the evenings. Um, so uh, you do need to get creative, uh, but look at the resources that are available. It sounds yeah. like you have talked about this too. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing your thoughts. So um, I know we are nearing five o'clock, but I think this is an important question that I, I think I wanna raise. Obviously we talk about, when we talk about um, lifestyle medicine, we talk about, I've used the word irresponsible behavior. And we as practitioners uh, are, are definitely sure that behavior change will bring about changes. The question is, if, we, if I think of self-care, if I think of doctors who want to do this, I mean, how do we encourage both the citizens and even practitioners to engage in programs that are aimed at changing behavior, knowing full well that folks, you need to change the behavior in order to adopt a healthy lifestyle. Any, any, any views um, that you may wanna share with the participants on, on that, please? Well, it's a very important point. All the things that I'm talking about have to do with behavior, have to do with changing behaviors yeah. if, if they are not positive. So there is a literature on this. Um, I believe you have the third edition of my textbook. There's a whole big section on behavior change and there are lots of theories about what works and what does. Some, some things work better for individuals, some things work better for the population. So uh, this is an area uh, that physicians ought to become more um, involved in. A couple of other points I think that are important. We know there's a very good literature that suggests that physicians who exercise are more likely to counsel their patients to exercise. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so the first thing that I would say to the medical community is, Physician, heal thyself. So, because if you can say, this is what I do, and let me try to help you figure out how you can do it in your life, that's, that's one a very, important, uh, very important aspect of it. And I think the other thing is we need to, we need to, to 
disabuse ourselves of the notion that the change doesn't occur. Change does occur, but it can, it can be slow. The average person who smokes cigarettes needs to, to try to stop six times before they, before they succeed. And so by the most important thing, I think, uh, is to say, we, we, we've got to, We've got to start by emphasizing it. We've got to, if you, if a physician doesn't ask, are you physically active? Um, how are you eating? Um, let's talk about your cigarette smoking. If, if to not asking about those things sends the message that we don't care about those things, but we do care about those things. And so I think the first, there's a, a good, um, uh, just to use the example of physical activity, there's a good questionnaire that comes out of, of Stanford University on, on the West Coast. It asks two questions. Um, do, do, how often do you exercise? How often do you get 30 minutes of physical activity? And the, the, the second, I can't remember what the second question, but there are only, there are only two questions that, um, the first one is, are you physically active? And then, then the second question is, how, how often do you get 30 minutes? Even if that behavior doesn't change, the fact that you've asked that says to the to, to the patient, um, I care about this. It's really really important. So um, I, I don't have. I, I understand that behavior change is difficult. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think what you're doing with population health is important. And um, I, I'm I'm glad to see that that the national health strategy has things like this in it. And, uh, and I think now get the government involved in this and, and uh, you know, get lifestyle medicine even more prominent and, and uh, you know, use the bully pulpit, as we say, uh, to say to the people in Qatar, um, we need to be in this together. We need, yeah. to, we need to, if we're going to improve the health of our nation, we need to start with those things that are making us unhealthy. And it's those, yeah. those habits that are doing that. Excellent, Dr. Ripley. I, I know it's well beyond five, but I, um, I, I wish we could stay for an hour. I mean, people are appreciating your comments, the, the responses to your questions. And I have a comment there, if I may just read that, and then we'll conclude with that. There's a comment about the sports programs engaging students and employees to have extracurricular activities that are part of curriculum and part of the ratings of evaluation for employees. And I, I think that's a great comment. I have always said that I think that health and wellness should become required curriculum, even in primary, secondary, and high schools. And uh, I don't know if you agree with that, but I personally feel that's when perceptions are being formed. Maybe the world would be different 50, 40 years from now if we were to begin that now. Make health and wellness required curriculum for everyone across the board. What's wrong with that, Dr. Rippey? Uh, I think that is absolutely correct. And um, I, if we can only translate the, the love that people in Qatar have for sports into more participation in their own physical activity, just like in the United States, we love sports too, but it's not enough to sit and drink a beer and love sports. You gotta, you gotta pay attention to your own physical activity. So maybe we can use the emphasis of understanding how fit the, the football players are and, uh, and emphasize that as part of the, it's not, it's not just how much, how much, how many mathematic symbols you learn. It's how are you doing those things when you're a child to, to set you on a course for a long and healthy life. So I totally agree with what you said. Thank you. Dr. Rippey, these remarks answer to your question is you have got us thinking even more. I am hoping that, that you will have time to come back maybe later and to share with your wisdom and knowledge on this subject so that there is more time, ample time for additional discussion, interactive discussion. So once again, thank you so much. We are so grateful to you uh, for accepting to talk to us on this very important subject. And as I said again, wishing and hoping that you will be back with us uh, again in the near future. So with that, we really appreciate it. And I wanna thank all the participants for appreciating Dr. Rippey's uh, lecture, his talk, his comments, but also I wanna thank you for being with us uh, this, this afternoon or that uh, uh, evening. So Dr. Rippey, just so you know, there were 250 participants for your talk. 
to me, that's commendable, a reflection of the content of, of what you have said. And we have enjoyed every moment, every minute of it. So thank you once again. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you. And I hope that many, many more people in Qatar will uh, view the video and uh, that we can make this the kind of emphasis. I would, I would love to come back and work with you some more. Uh, what you're doing is important, important work. I can't think of anything in healthcare that's more important than emphasizing this to individuals and the population. So God bless you for doing that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, thanks to all the participants. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, and we will see you at our next seminar, inshallah. Have a great evening and a good night.